Can you hear me if I just kind of stand near the mic? Okay. Um, thanks for having me. And yeah, it was a great day yesterday. I agree. Thanks to everyone for getting out there and participating in our democracy. It's uh, so important. And today I'm going to talk about how we can all participate even more, both in our democracy, in our government, in our communities, in our workplaces, et cetera. And I'm going to talk about how we all have the power to be movement starters. So let's see. Do I have to point this at anything? OK. So the first question is, what is a movement? And I'll say, before I, before I jump into this, yeah, the context here is that I, I spent a long time in tech, and then I spent four and a half years, as she said, leading change.org which just showed me the power that everyday people have to do amazing things in the world. And now at Facebook, where I lead groups, I see the same thing. Tens of millions of people who start communities that empower and engage one and a half billion people every month to connect together over the things that really matter in their lives, to take action in the world, et cetera. So the reason I wrote the book, Purposeful, is that I, I learned so much from watching all of these people and understanding that they were just regular people, just like you and me. Like, they are amazing in what they've accomplished, but they don't start out as you know, Nelson Mandela or Gloria Steinem. They start out as regular people. And so the idea was, how can I take the skills that these people have and the things that they do and break them down into pieces so that more of us know that we can do this? So that's the premise. So the question is, what is a movement? And we all look at things like this and we say, OK, how many of you went to the Women's March um, two years ago? Oh. What? Yeah, pretty awesome. Yeah. Largest, yeah. <laughs> largest single one day movement ever organized at that point. Women marching all over the world. This is clearly a movement. Um, one people don't realize, though, is that even movements that are this big start with you know, one or where am I pointing this? Does someone know? Like, OK. <laughs> like, just randomly. OK. They start with individual people. Does anybody know who this is? She is. Her name is Teresa Shook. She is a retired grandmother who lives in Hawaii. Yeah, good. Someone knows this whole story. And uh, she woke up the day after the election last year, and I'm not going to make a partisan comment on this, but she was personally unhappy about the result, and she said to her friends, I think we should march. She just wrote those words on her own Facebook page, and then she decided to start an event, and she invited 50 people to her event. And then she went to sleep. She left it open as a public event, by the way. She woke up in the morning. There were 10,000 people signed up for her event to march in January. And then it got shared to more and more people. It ended up getting shared in several groups. And it became what we ultimately saw, which was millions and millions of women out there marching because of one individual person who just took a stand and said, this is what I think we should do. So even the biggest movements start with a, usually a single person or small group and a pretty small action. The other thing I want to say about movements is that they aren't all enormous. Like You don't have to start the Women's March. You can start something inside your company. You can start something in your neighborhood, at your school, at your kid's school. Like All of these things count as movements if you get someone behind you, other people behind you, and you accomplish something that you want to see changed. The other question is, I get a lot is, what about business? Like, Is it only social activists and organizers who get the, out there and change the world? And the answer to that is definitely no. So there are people in the world who effectively persuade businesses to take action. And I'm sure we've seen some of that here at Samsung and the other places we've worked. They take action that inspires um, companies. So this is a woman named Manal Rostam. She is an Egyptian woman. She was a pharmaceuticals rep and also an athlete. And one day she was in Egypt with her cousin, and they were on a bus tour fun kind of touristy bus tour. And they were playing a game, and they switched seats with each other. And then five minutes later, the bus got in a horrible accident, rolled over three times. And her cousin, with whom she had just switched seats, ended up dying in that accident. And she lived. And so Manal wasn't sure what to do. And 
this event shook her to her core and it actually made her reevaluate her faith. She's a Muslim woman. And she decided at that point to start wearing the hijab. And for many years she wore it without too many incidents. And then one day she said she started feeling more discrimination, more issues. She would go into places, she would get questioned. She would show up, especially as an athlete, and have people just questioning her. How can you run in all these layers? Oh, don't you get hot, et cetera. And she started a group on Facebook called Surviving Hijab, where she could just talk to other women about this experience. And she invited, again, just a couple dozen people she knew. And over the past few years, this group has grown to half a million women all over the world, talking to each other about what this experience is like, celebrating each other and the pride they have in their connection to their faith. And Manal, at that point, realized she had a movement behind her. And with that movement of followers and allies, she could do more. And so one of the things that bothered her was that she never had good athletic gear to wear. And so she took the one small action, which was emailing someone she found at Nike. And she just said, why do you have no veiled women runners in your ads? That's all she wanted to know. Like, how, why aren't we better represented? And amazingly, the person who got her email responded to her. And he actually was excited and so excited that he, in his response he said, you know, we've been thinking about this at Nike. Can you meet tomorrow? Like, he didn't just say, sure, we'll talk about this at some point. This is a company responding to a consumer movement. So an individual and her supporters persuading a company. They met with her They over the period of several months and ultimately about a year. They invited her several times and they ended up launching in January of this year Nike Pro Hijab, a line of athletic gear for Muslim women. Manal is one of their spokespeople now. You've probably seen several of them. One was in the a boxer. I think she was in the, the Kaepernick ad that came out recently. Um, but this is an example of how consumers can really push businesses to do the right thing. And then, of course, businesses themselves can also be movements. So this is Neil Grimmer. Does anybody know Plum Organics? Have you seen this brand? Um, a few people. It is an organic baby food brand. So Neil was actually kind of a punk rocker designer at IDEO. And then one day he had kids, and he and his wife wanted organic baby food. And there just wasn't organic baby food available on the market at the time. And so they started making their own baby food at home, you know, pureeing organic vegetables and such. And he said that he and his wife one night just said, you know, there's got to be a better way. Like, if I want this, probably other people do too. And so they decided at that moment that they would try to launch an organic baby food brand. And they did. They launched Plum Organics. It was a not an easy task. They had a lot of ups and downs. But ultimately, Plum became the largest organic baby food brand on the market. They were ultimately purchased by Campbell Soup, who now runs this brand at large scale. And now, not only did he successfully build a brand about it around this, he changed the whole category. So the projections are that in the next 10 years, organic baby food will account for 70% of all baby food sold. So individual people can start movements, whether they are for activism or through business. So this is what I call the leadership thread. Like After I watched all these people, interviewed so many people, I basically realized that they go through these same six steps and they have techniques that help them successfully go through them. So I'm going to walk through um, each of these steps. I'm not going to go through every single detail, but I'll share a few examples of each step and how people go through them. So the first is garnering the courage to get started in the first place. Second is creating a clear and compelling vision that people want to follow. The third is mobilizing people, getting your first supporters around that vision, then persuading decision makers that you might need to persuade, navigating criticism, and overcoming obstacles. So the very first part, getting started. Can I see a show of hands? Has anyone in here ever started a standing ovation? OK, I got two, three. Yeah, that's about what I see. In like most audiences, it's like 5% of people have ever done this. 
Um, most people don't do it. Well, some people don't do it because the shows are just bad. Like, yeah, but um, most people don't do it because it's kind of scary. Like standing up in front of everybody, not sure whether anyone will join you, is a kind of scary thing. You have to expose yourself in front of other people. So the second part of this question is, how many of you have ever been at a show of any kind where only one person ever stood up and no one joined them? Yeah, so three or four. So about the same number, but not very common. Like the vast majority of the time, someone stands up and people join them. That's just what they do. And movements are kind of like that too. Like the first act of getting out there and saying, I believe in this and I am going to ask for your help in achieving it is what starts a movement. And it's why standing ovations work, because that's what they do. You, you basically say, I believe in this, and I'm asking you to join me. And I've been trying uh, to start more of these now myself, just because I talk about it, and I'm like, huh, I should try this, like experiment a little bit more often. Um, and I will say, it's, a li it's still scary. Like every time I do it, I still get a little bit scared. And sometimes it takes longer than others. Like there have been places where I've stood for maybe like a minute before someone else stood up and you're like, okay, is someone gonna join me? But I have never been the only one standing. And it might happen at some point if I try it enough. But um, getting started is the first step. Second step is about creating clear and compelling vision. And what I've learned from talking to many, many people who do this is that the best visions have three parts. So the first is a clearly articulated desired future. So what do I want the world to look like? So Neil Grimmer could say, you know, I want a world in which all parents can have access to organic, healthy food for their babies. That's what the desired future looks like. A clear purpose is the reason why it matters to you. So Neil could say, my children are important to me. I want them to grow up without pesticides and antibiotics and so forth. And so it's important to me because it's important to my kids. And then the compelling story is the part that most people forget when they share their visions, which is that people are much more likely to react and get behind a real story of a real person rather than some vague, big idea. So even saying I want all babies to have organic baby food is interesting, but it's like it could feel very far away. And so Neil's own personal story was he and his wife were up late at night, every night, like 11 o'clock at night, pureeing some vegetable du jour and like exhausted and drained because they're making this baby food. And that all of a sudden starts to bring it a little bit more to life. And it is true that the more dramatic the story, the more likely people are to rally behind it. And there's a certain amount of willingness to be vulnerable here that I've also seen be successful in a lot of movements. Um, this is Marshall Gans, one of the kind of most famous social organizers in the world. He now teaches at um, Kennedy School of Government. Um, he talks about a narrative for a story as having three parts. It is a story of self, a story of us, and a story of now. So a story of self is about me and why this thing matters to me again. The story of us is why it relates to all of us, what we have in common that can bring us together around this idea. And a story of now is why does it matter to take action right now? What will change if we take action right now on this thing? So I'm gonna share a story here of one of the people whose stories is in the book, um, whose story drove his vision. And there's a video I'll start with. Last December at this Marshall, Texas hotel, Carrie Dunn was stabbed to death. Her strange husband, a suspect, Dunn's nine-year-old daughter, saw it happen and dialed 911 four times, but never got help. I felt guilty uh, because we had told her to dial 911. Dunn's father, Hank Hunt, knows his granddaughter did exactly what she was taught, what we're all taught. You never need help dialing 911, and that's what she did in the other day. So this story is just crushing. Um, Carrie Dunn, yeah, her estranged husband basically stabbed her to death in a motel bathroom while her three children were on the other side of the bathroom wall. And the nine-year-old who was the oldest there dialed 911 multiple times and couldn't get 
through because it, you're required to dial nine out of a hotel. And so Hank said, I mean, when he tells this story, he says, you know, my granddaughter was sitting on my lap and she just kept looking at me back and forth. I did, I did what you told me to do. I tried and he just felt so crushed by this that he dedicated himself to passing what he calls Carrie's Law, which is requiring all businesses of any kind to allow direct dial of 911. And Hank started a change.org petition as his first step and it was signed by over 100,000 people and he then went through all the things that you need to do to persuade Congress to pass a law like this and he had hundreds of thousands of allies behind him. It was not a super easy fight because as you know it's hard to get anything passed in Congress um, but he did and President Trump signed this into law uh, in January of this year. So if Hank hadn't been willing to put himself out there and share this really difficult story with the world, bring them into his pain, and let them help him push this forward, then he wouldn't have been able to succeed. But he did succeed, and again, he's just a regular person. Like, he describes himself as, you know, a regular guy from Texas. He married his high school sweetheart, he joined the military, he, like, used to pull girls' ponytails. Like, that's how he describes himself. And he is now, you know, a really effective movement starter. And his vision, the desired future, was that this would never happen to anyone else's child. Okay, I'm gonna change gears here. <laughs> Go from something really tough to really silly, so excuse me for doing that. Um, the next step is about mobilizing people behind your vision. So once you have that clarity of vision, movements are started by individuals or small groups, but they, they really are not a movement until you have followers and allies. So there's a famous uh, TED talk about movement uh, followers, and some of you may have seen this. There's a video in it that I'm gonna show, a quick video. The key to gaining supporters is how you embrace them. So at first you ask for help, and then when they agree to help you, how do you really embrace them about ways that they can help you? So here's this gentleman. He is starting a movement of his own, dancing on this hill, kind of crazy. Here comes his first follower, which by the way took like five minutes, but I didn't show you that part of the video. And there he is embracing him. He doesn't just leave him be, he actually grabs him, twirls him around, dances together, and that causes more followers, who he also embraces. See, he's dancing with them there, and then more followers, and more followers, and eventually pretty much the whole hill is dancing with this person. I think in a minute they're like, they all get up. Um, so this is kind of what it feels like, and the key thing is about how do you really take advantage of the first few people that come and join you. And what I've seen be successful here is that people either ask for specific things, like here's what I need, can you help me with this thing? Or they wait till people join them and they assign them specific roles and say, you know, based on your strengths, here's what you can do. So a couple examples here. This woman, Greta Rose Van Riel, she is known as the Instagram queen. She has 16 million followers on Instagram now and she's like in her early 30s, I think. She has started multiple multi-million dollar businesses on her own. Her first one was Skinny Me Tea. So she invented this thing called the Tea Talks, um, which is, you know, her, was her way to say, how can you be healthier and like detox your body by drinking this tea, which is again all organic and so forth. And in order to um, try to find her first followers, she basically did some of the first ever influencer marketing on Instagram. She found other people like herself who had at least a thousand followers. She sent them her tea and she said, try it and see what you think. And if you like it, talk to your followers about it. This was enough, oops, sorry, went too far. Uh, this was enough to drive her business to $600,000 in sales per month in the first few months of her launching this. So she started a movement around this business by bringing in early followers who could be then supporters and allies of hers. 
This also happens on the social organizing side. This is, these are two women, Jennifer Cardenas on the right and her sister Shanna. Jennifer, they lived, um, well Jennifer lived outside of Houston and during Hurricane Harvey she had to evacuate Houston along with everyone else. And she was worried about where everyone was going. So she started a group on Facebook where she just invited some of her friends and said, tell me where you're evacuating so we can keep track of how everyone is and where everyone's going. And it was another one of these examples, hers growing much more quickly. She invited just some friends before dinner. She left dinner, there were 800 people in the group. She went to bed, there were 30,000 people in the group. And over the next day, it grew to 150,000. And then Jennifer took those early first people who were really active in the group, and she said, you know, how can you help me? She actually made 80 of them moderators of the group because she knew she couldn't do it by herself. And then they each started taking specific roles. So one of them said, I'll make a spreadsheet to track like where people are and anyone who needs to be rescued. One said, I'll coordinate with the Coast Guard. One said, you know, I'll take, I've, I've been through this before, so I'll share my stories and examples. And then an incredible thing happened. Jennifer went back into the area because, long story, but her mother ended up not evacuating. So she went back to go make sure her mom was okay. And she then lost internet access because there was no internet access in the heart of where the storm hit. And so she, as the movement starter, was no longer available to the movement at all. And the best movement starters are the ones who do this well. She had those other early followers in the right roles. And so even though she was completely unattached to the group for the next three or four days, the group themselves ended up being responsible for rescuing 8,000 people from Hurricane Harvey, even without her. So the best movement starters really embrace those early followers and help guide them such that they can actually do it on their own. That's their town. Okay, next step is about persuading decision makers. And not every movement has decision makers they need to persuade, but most of them do. So if you're trying to get something accomplished within your company or at your children's school or you wanna pass a law, there are decision makers that you need to persuade. And there are a few techniques that I've seen successful movement starters use that are really helpful in thinking about how to change someone's mind or convince them of something. The first is called influence mapping, and sometimes, or sometimes called power mapping, but I, I prefer influence mapping, where you think about who are the people that influence the person that you're trying to persuade. So this is Luann Calvert. She was the CMO of Virgin America. Uh, she had the job, so does anybody remember early Virgin America flyers, this safety video, this animated one? Okay, I'm going to play like Hello, 30 seconds of it. Thanks for flying with Virgin America. A few announcements as we begin our flight. Everyone should have a look at the safety card that is in the seat pocket in front of you. Not only does it have pretty pictures, but it has important information about the location and how to operate all exits and explains other safety features of this airplane. Okay, so this was the original safety video of Virgin America. Everybody loved it. It literally was like the thing that built their brand. It was universally loved by their customers. And when Luann started, and after a bit, she heard from the FAA that this video did not meet their requirements because you couldn't properly subtitle it for people who were hard of hearing. So she had to change the video and she was freaking out because she just didn't know how she could do something that would top this. And she brainstormed and came up with a bunch of ideas. And her idea was musical rhyming safety video. Like she knew she had to do something that had never been done before. And so she came up with that idea. And she wanted to make sure though that since this idea was a little bit out there that she could effectively persuade the CEO of Virgin America to go ahead with this idea. And he was a pretty skeptical guy in general, and she knew this, and so what she did was influence mapping. She said, who will help persuade the person I'm trying to persuade? And she went to all of them first, and she basically got them on board about this video. So she went to, you know, she went to the FAA to make sure it would pass. She went to all the other execs of Virgin America. She went to their flight attendants to make sure they loved it. They, she even went to frequent flyers of the company to make sure they would like it. 
And in the end, she took it to, for the final approval and the CEO said, oh, I don't know. Like, this is music. It's really, it grates on me and like, it's gonna grate on you over time. And there's the way I'm thinking, oh God, like, did I do enough? And what happened was the then new COO of Virgin America, who was one person on her influence map, spoke up and said, you know what? I really disagree. I feel like the more you listen to it, the more you love it. And that one person was enough to flip the CEO. This was the result of that. Anybody seen this? Subtitles. <laughs> I won't play the whole thing. Okay, so for anybody who's flown Virgin America, before it went out of business, I mean not went out of business, was acquired, um, you probably saw that video. That video was so successful that not only was it loved by their customers, it was viewed on YouTube 13 million times. The safety video for the airline, right? So like this, she started a movement for her company, inside her company by influence mapping. And then what happened is the brand became such a big movement in itself that they were able to do this. So when they wanted, there were two gates opening at the Dallas airport, Virgin America wanted them. And instead of just going to the airport commission, they started a petition on change.org and asked their own customers to sign it. And they did, almost 28,000 people signed it in two weeks and they took that to the airport commission instead and they got the two gates at the Dallas airport. So brands themselves can also become movements. Okay, the second uh, thing I wanna talk about in terms of persuading decision makers, once you think about who are the people who influence them, it's also really important to understand what they're motivated by. And as an example, politicians we know are motivated by their own reelection to office. They're motivated in the, also by serving their constituents, but they are behind that also motivated about their own reelection. So this is Amanda Wynn, one of the most incredible women I've ever met. She was actually nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize this year. She is a young woman. When she was in her senior year at Harvard, she was raped by a stranger. And she went to the hospital, had a rape kit done, and then she went to the police and said, you know, what do I do about this? And she learned that in the state of Massachusetts, rape kits are only kept in evidence for six months unless the survivor goes and files paperwork every six months to say, please do not throw my evidence in the garbage. Like this would not happen for any other crime. If you can imagine, like this is just a sign of how this country treats mainly women, but sexual assault survivors in general. So Amanda said, this doesn't make sense and I wanna change it. And she did a, a long line of brave things, but the first, her first small step, she emailed everybody she knew. She said, this is what happened to me. This is what I want to change. Will you help me? And pretty much everybody said yes. And so all of a sudden, Amanda had all of these people as the supporters and allies who had distinct specific skills that could help her. They were accountants, financial analysts, engineers, lawyers, comedians, like her group of friends, quite eclectic. And she rallied all of their skills into a movement she called RISE. She started an organization and what they did was understand the people they were trying to persuade, which at the time was state legislators in Massachusetts. And they went and she had her lawyers write the law. Like, so no one else had to do the work, what would this law look like? She had her finance people go look at how it would affect the state finances and how they could make it roughly neutral for them. She had the comedians, they partnered with Funny or Die and they made a video about this, which you wouldn't think is a funny topic, but they poked fun at how crazy this is that the laws are this way. They actually had a woman who 
was talking to her friend and she said, I have the sexual assault survivor's utility belt. It has a timer so that I can set it every six months to know when to go file my paperwork. It has a, you know, gloves so I can dive in the dumpster to get my evidence out of the garbage. Like it wasn't funny, but it was poking fun. And with that, they went and they were able to pass the law in Massachusetts. And it was so successful that actually members of Congress said, we would like to look at this law for the United States. She found other survivors to join her. They went to Washington, D.C., and they individually sat down with members of Congress and said, here's my story, individual people with their real personal stories. Here's the law we have. Any questions they got, she went back to her army of volunteers and she said, how can I answer this question in 24 hours? And they went back the next day and answered all their questions. So Amanda, and here's actually some of her joint survivors that she found. That's them bringing their signatures to Congress. And Amanda and this RISE Army passed this law, Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights, unanimously in the United States Congress in 2017. It is one of only 21 bills since 1989 to pass unanimously. And the amazing thing is that even when you pass it at the federal level, turns out most of these laws are statewide. And so now RISE is working on passing this law state by state by state. And what Amanda has done as a movement starter is that she said, it can't just be me. So she found a survivor in every single state and she trained them on how to do this themselves, how to lead it themselves. And they have now passed 19 states in less than a year. So really powerful stuff if you know what it is that motivates the people you're trying to move. So ultimately, the best combination here is the data plus the stories. That's the real magic in persuading decision makers. Okay, navigating criticism. So what I will say is that the more successful you get, the more likely you are to be exposed to criticism and especially the hater and troll variety who love to criticize people um, these days. So I tend to, well first I'll start with this quote from Jeff Bezos, if you don't want, if you can't tolerate critics then don't do anything new or interesting. Um, because it's just, it is a part of the package. Like we have to understand that when we take a stand that people will criticize us. And what I have seen be successful is people who can bucket criticism into two categories. First, and I, especially like people who are public figures do this really well. The first category is about things you cannot change, right? Things that are out of your control. People who criticize you for your gender, your race, your age, your ability, you know, things that you can't control. And for those people, I say, set that aside. Like that will not be useful to you. Getting in the middle of it is, is not healthy. And in general, I'd say like, if it, especially if it crosses into bullying or harassment, there are tools and people should be reporting these things. Every social media platform has tools and we should not put up with things that are you know, crossing that line into threats or harassment or actual bullying. Once you set that aside though, there's lots of other criticism out there that actually either can be helpful or there are ways to kind of manage dealing with it that I've seen people use. So I wanna share a few techniques here. First is about finding your allies. So um, this is a woman, Viola Desmond. She actually is the woman that you see on the $10 banknote in Canada. The woman who got this to happen is a woman named Myrna Forster, who started a campaign to say we should have women on banknotes in Canada. That's what they call them in Canada, I think. Um, and Myrna had this petition and it just said, let's put women on currency. And lots of people supported her. People came and signed her petition and they said, here's why it matters to me and so forth. And then she had her fair share of critics too. She would get people who tweeted mean things at her. She'd get people who called into radio shows she was on and they'd say things like, women only belong on currency if they're topless or you know, just horrible, ridiculous things like that. Um, and so what Myrna did was she, kept reminding herself of the people who were behind her. So she actually took her change.org petition. There's an area on there called reasons for signing. 
and she printed it out, all people's reasons for signing, like pages and pages of it, and she just carried it around with her. And every time someone said something mean, she pulled out those comments and she just read them again. And she just reminded herself how many allies were behind her. And this was the ultimate result, Viola Desmond on the $10 note. The second strategy I've seen, which I think is incredible, is what I call leveraging the naysayers. So take the people who are criticizing you and try to use their criticism to your advantage. This is Mary Lou Jepsen. Does anyone know her? She, she talked at Watermark? Or, yeah, one person. So she's, she is incredible tech mind. She's worked at actually both Facebook and Google in their labs. Um, but before that, she was the co-founder of this organization called One Laptop Per Child. They were making solar powered, light readable, very inexpensive laptops for children in the developing world. And when she first started, everyone told her, this is not doable. Like this thing that you're saying is just crazy and it will never work. And so instead of getting discouraged by that, she actually leveraged that to help her. And what she did was she went out to meet with a bunch of execs at one of the large tech companies in Asia. And they told her, they listened to her pitch, and then at the end they said, there are 23 reasons why this won't work. And instead of getting discouraged by that, Mary Lou said, okay, can you please tell me what they are? And they read her the 23 reasons why it was a horrible idea, and she took notes, and at the end she said, I think I know how to solve 17 of these. Why don't I go back and like work on the rest, and then I'll come back to you, and you can tell me if there's anything else wrong with my ideas. And that's what she did. And she basically used them, some of the smartest execs at one of the largest tech companies, to debug her product at this small nonprofit. And if she had just seen them as critics and let that get her down and discouraged and stopped, she probably wouldn't have been successful. Her critics were ultimately the ones who made her get this over the line, and now it's used by three million children in the developing world. Okay, third strategy here is what I call the bear hug. So this is based on the idea that people do not come out of the womb as haters and trolls. Like something is causing them to act that way and it is usually some kind of pain or bad event or something in their own lives. And so sometimes there is a way to disarm hate with an oversized amount of love and understanding. And this is a situation when I, probably my first few months after I got to change.org, I, uh, I started, we started getting spammed basically by someone in Spain. He was adding fake signatures to our petitions, one at a time, screenshotting them, and then tweeting them to members of the press. Now, we had tools that could catch fake signatures in bulk, so it was impossible to you know, create massive fraud on a petition, but individual fake signatures, when you write like Mickey Mouse signed this, sometimes that would take us like 24 hours to take down. So there, were, there was room to put single individual you know, fake signatures and take a screenshot to prove they were there. And we did not know what to do about this. I had a room full of engineers. We were trying to say, okay, do we block his IP address? Like what other technical solutions can we do? And one of the execs at the time said, why don't we try the bear hug? I was like, okay, what's the bear hug? And he said, well, let's just like, you know, give him a hug, see what's bothering him. Why don't you fly me to Spain, this island in Spain where this guy lives, and I'll just go talk to him. I was like, you want me to fly you to Spain? But then I thought about the cost, and it was actually way less expensive to fly one person to Spain than to have a whole team of engineers work on this for who knows how long. <laughs> and so I did, I flew him to Spain, and he talked to him. He went and met the spammer, and he learned that what was driving it is that there was one particular issue he was really passionate about, and he really wanted to be successful, and he was worried that there might be fake signatures on it, and that it therefore wouldn't be successful, so he went about trying to prove that that was possible. And when we explained to him the way the system worked, and then he understood that it wasn't possible to do it in bulk, then I got this picture of the two of them and this tweet from him saying, there's goodwill, and he stopped spamming us. 
so it, it turns out that a little bit of love and understanding can go a long way, even when unexpected. And then the last strategy I have here is what I call maintaining perspective. So this is my family. I have two teenage daughters. Um, and one of the things that has helped me personally through some of these harder moments where you're being really criticized or attacked for something is to remember the things that are really important. And I tell a story in Purposeful about um, one of the hardest days in my own life personally, which is when my older daughter got in a very bad accident at school and was essentially had a traumatic brain injury and ended up in a coma in the hospital. And I was at a work offsite in the Santa Cruz Mountains which was like the worst ever place to be with my whole team. And we had to like, I think we had carpooled, we had to like rush down there together to the hospital. And for the next week, I wasn't really sure whether she would live. And that, those moments just show us everything about what is important. And ever since then, so she, she's 18 now, she just went to college, so she, you know, it all turned out okay. Um, but in those moments where other people are attacking me, I can pretty easily draw that back and say like, this stuff just doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Okay, last step here, overcoming obstacles. Um, so this is Kara Golden, everybody, I think she came and talked at Watermark, so do you guys probably, a bunch of you probably heard her story already, this is Hint Water. Um, so Kara is a great, I mean, every single movement starter I talk to has stories about obstacles. Like there is no version of this where you like start your movement and run into no challenges and you get what you want. Um, they're all very up and down. And so this is Kara. She started Hint Water because when she was, she had had three children, she was a tech exec and she was having trouble like losing the weight from her third child and she, tried eating healthier and nothing was working and then one day she decided to cut out diet soda and start drinking water and for her that was the solution and she lost all this weight and then she said you know what water like it's just so boring like i wish i could have water that had some flavor in it and so she went to whole foods and said um can you help me find the flavored water <laughs> and they said, sure, here's vitamin water, which is what they offered her, which has, of course, as most of us know, more sugar than like a Coca-Cola. Um, and so she said, isn't there anything like this? And he said, no. And so she decided she would try to make it. And she faced so many obstacles, starting with that person in Whole Foods. She said, well, if I make it, will you put it on the shelves? And he's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> if you make it, go ahead, then I'll put it on the shelves. Totally did not believe her. Then she went through obstacle after obstacle of, you know, how do you make something like this shelf stable? How do you persuade stores to make shelf space for it? She at one point thought it was too much and thought she might sell to another company. She had a talk with a, one of the big beverage execs and he said, sweetie, people like sweet. Like they'll never like this. And she said, okay, that's it. Like if he's gonna call me sweetie, I'm just gonna go after it. <laughs> and she didn't sell and kind of the rest is history. But so many obstacles over and over again. And it's getting through those obstacles that has helped her make this not in, just into a movement about beverages, but it's actually now becoming healthy living kind of movement. So the, the product she launched after Hint Water, which no beverage exec would have ever thought would make sense, was Hint Sunscreen. She said, I also want healthier sunscreen for my body and I have all these scents left over from the fruit that are in my water. What if I made sunscreen and scented it with fruit? And when she went to sell it for the first time, she sold it online. 60% of all people who had ever bought Hint water online bought her sunscreen too, because they believe in Hint as a movement. So what I say about obstacles, this is the way I describe being a movement starter, a leader of any kind, an entrepreneur. It's kind of like climbing a mountain. And some days you feel like you're at the top or near the top and it's like super sunny and you brought a picnic lunch and everything is awesome. And other days you're like at the way bottom. You have like a giant heavy backpack, there's a storm coming, you cannot even see the top. 
And these days just go back and forth all the time, and sometimes they happen on the same day. I actually didn't have this slide in here originally, but today I got one really awesome email about something that we had done that was really well received, and I was like, woo, top of the mountain. And then I got here, and I found out one really bummer thing about someone on my team that might leave, bottom of the mountain. And like, it just happens every day for all of us. And so the thing that I think makes people successful is just keep climbing, right? You know that the sunny days will come and that cloudy days will come. And on the sunny days, you appreciate them because you know a cloudy day might be around the corner. In fact, it's even harder. Like sometimes people wanna sit down and have the picnic on the sunny day. <laughs> don't, do, don't do too many picnicking because you gotta keep going up. And on the cloudy day, just remembering that the sunny days will come again. So keep climbing, bring people that you want to climb with along with you. And in the end, it's all one leadership thread. All leaders are the same, and we are all movement starters. So thank you. OK, I think I'm staying here. You can do it here. Thank you for that. Um, I think in thinking about your last comment, that the sunny days will come. So how do you ride that from going from up from down to up to down and when things just are at the lowest, whether it's at work or your personal life, and it just is so hard, how do you get past that, that one moment? I'm gonna need to share the mic yeah. since there's only one. Um, yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I think the best strategy is the allies strategy, right? Having people around you who you know are there for you even when the days get hard. That's certainly what I rely on personally and what I've seen in talking to most of these folks. Um, the other thing is just keeping that perspective. Um, you know, people, people might have things, other things that make them happy, right? So like getting out of the space that's making you unhappy and into the zone of things that make you happy, whether it's you know, cooking food or sing. Like I once had a, a coach that told me, which I thought at the time was horrible advice, but um, I need more music in my life and I should listen to music and sing in the car on the way to work. And I was like, really, that is your executive coaching advice for me? Um, and at the time, I, I thought she was nuts, but some days since then, I periodically will put on my Spotify in the car on a long drive and sing like at the top of my lungs in the car. And for me personally, that always makes me feel better. So like whatever it is that makes you feel good is what to do on those days. It's those small moments. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Erin Salachek. I'm the VP of Events and Marketing for Watermark. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. We're going to go ahead and open it up to some questions. So use your big, loud voices. Uh, feel free to come up here and use the mic if you'd like. But do we have any questions to start off? Yeah. First of all, is your book for sale? <laughs> yeah, so the book, um, this is the book, and it is certainly for sale online. We have a few copies here today. There was originally going to be a bookseller, and she fell ill, so I brought whatever copies I had, and um, those are available in the back. I will sign them. Um, the book is also available online, and I will say, too, that there is a Facebook group called Purposeful for anyone who wants to join a community of people who want to help each other in the movements they want to start, and that is available to you whether or not you read the book. So. I, I asked because I have so enjoyed it. I've been reading it, uh, and I'd like for you to tell your own story of your experiences being a movement maker when you were in college. <laughs> Thanks. This is very well set up. Um, yeah. uh, yes, so the book is full of stories. Many of them are the people that I've shared tonight, and there are many more that I did not share, and a few of them are my own. Uh, I tell a story about how when I was in high school, I was a coxswain on the crew team. Does anybody know what a coxswain is? Any rowers or coxswains in the room? Yeah. Awesome. So yes, the coxswain is the person who sits technically in the 
back of the boat and steers for the races and also strategizes. You, you keep control of how many strokes per minute they're taking. You can actually have a little machine that tells you that. And you coach people in the boat during the race. And it's actually where I learned like the bulk of my leadership skills because you have to do things like push people past where they think they can go and give feedback in real time to people in front of other people and so forth. Um, but when I was in high school, I cocked the men's crew team. And then when I got to college, I said, I would like to cox men's crew. And they said, no, you can't do that because you're a woman. And I said, well, why not? And I said, couldn't I just try out, like, if I'm bad at it, then don't let me do it. But if I'm good, wouldn't you accept me? Because it's not, this particular role is not a gender-based role, right? It's not like I was suggesting I row men's crew, for which I would be way too small and, you know, too wimpy. But the coxswain's role is a strategy role, and actually it has a requirement that you be small, which I happen to meet quite well. Um, and they said, no, sorry, we think you'd be too distracting. Um, which reminded me of the, the meme that went around about women scientists a few years ago. If you remember, there were all these tweets called distractingly sexy, and they would like put their pictures of themselves like with, you know, cheetah poop and hazmat suits and so forth. Um, and so anyway, I tried asking several people. I went to my coach, I went to men's coach, I went to the varsity coach, I ultimately went to the athletic director of the university tried to persuade each of them why this didn't make sense and why they should let me try out. And they all said no, one by one, just said no. Uh, and so at that point, you know, I, in, in hindsight, I wish I hadn't given up, but I did say, okay, I'm just gonna join the women's team, which I did. And then about three months later, I got a call from the athletic director and he said, we've been talking about it since you came to talk to us all and we've changed our minds and you can cox the men's team if you want. And at that point, I had already joined the women's team and I'm a fairly loyal person, so I did not move teams. My boat won nationals that year, so I was like, ha, huh, pretty good at this. But um, <laughs> anyway, and, but from then on, like I wasn't really fighting it only for me, I was fighting it for every woman that came after me. And a few years ago, I went back to visit this school and said, I asked one of the rowers, how many of the coxswains on the men's team are women? And they said, well, almost all of them. It just makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah, it does, it makes sense, so. Yeah. Do you want to use the mic? Oh, that's as far as it goes, so. Um, I was just wondering, what made you uh, put all your experiences and stories into your book, and how did you actually go about writing with your you know, job and everything? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, so first of all, books are a very slow process. Like for those of us who work in tech, it was surprising to me how long this took uh, because it was multiple years of working on it. Uh, the reason, so I, as I said, the reason I wrote it is because I was hearing all these things that I just wanted to share with more people and pr convince more people that were able to do this. Um, the interesting story about how it happened the story I told about my daughter tonight, I actually told a longer version of that at a conference I was at in Europe um, a few years ago. And I was, it was a conference on the future of work. And I was talking about you know, how our lives are inextricably intertwined now and our personal lives and the technology that, that ties our work and life together. And I asked the audience, I had a list of questions I wanted to ask the audience to make that point. And the first question I asked was, how many of you have ever received serious medical news about yourself or a loved one while at work? And like 80% of the audience stood up on that first question. And then it was this weird moment where everybody just looked around and was like, oh my God, you too, me too. What, you know, these are things we can actually share with each other. And it was a really powerful moment. And it turns out there was someone there who worked for Penguin and came up to me afterwards and said, I think you should write a book. So I didn't, I sort of stumbled into it. Um, what I will say is I was pretty intimidated about actually writing it, because I never considered myself a writer. And I write for LinkedIn influencers. They invited me to do that when they first started the program. And that was also super intimidating. And I agreed to do it because I thought it would be, 
you know, good for me to kind of do the thing I thought was hard. And the way I got through it was I basically just went through each of my experiences and most of the people I know, and I started a post that, that started five lessons I learned from, dot, dot, dot. And then I would just take the bullets of the things I had learned from that person or that experience, and I realized that I could literally call on any person in my life or any experience and pull out five lessons, which I wish I had actually done much sooner because there were a lot of lessons that I had never really thought about. And so and it ended up in the book itself, which I wrote mainly on nights and weekends, and I took one week off by myself in Marin. <laughs> and. I just wrote them as individual stories, just like I wrote for LinkedIn. So I basically just outlined the structure of the book and the chapters and each story that laid it out. And then I you know, did the connecting pieces afterwards. And that's what made it easier for me. Yeah, I might, you might have to come up here. <laughs> great. Well, first of all, thank you. This sure. was really great. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is, what advice you might have for someone myself and other people that have ideas, you know, working mom, busy, and I've had an idea that involves uh, helping funding national parks. And yeah. my husband and I are really excited, and we start talking about it, we get all these ideas, and then I just get so intimidated about, again, the time. Mm -hmm. How do I find the time to do this, balancing everything? And I was just curious what advice you would have for someone to start. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, honestly, it is literally just the getting started. It doesn't matter what you do first, it's doing anything that matters. And um, I think the other thing is sometimes the first thing doesn't work, and so you don't have to be set on like, okay, this first action has to be the perfect action, which then has the ripple effect to everything else. You try one thing, if it doesn't work, like there's a story in the book about my startup, which yes, in the end was successful and we sold to Google, but was had four different versions and actually three different names before it was successful. So sometimes it's just you know getting out there and doing something. The other thing is just that you shouldn't expect that you have to do it alone. So the one question is like, how do you find other people that are passionate about the same thing you are passionate about? And um, that's something I see happening every day in my job at Facebook now because people start these communities. They don't necessarily start them as movements. They start them as communities of people who are passionate about the same thing. And you could just start a community like that. Invite your friends, have them invite their friends. I would suggest joining the purposeful group where people are giving each other advice about stuff like this. And you just get going and then you ask other people for advice. Um, and there's other tips there in the book. But I think the other, the other thing is that if it does ultimately become super successful and takes a ton of time, then maybe there's something there that could be like a more full-time kind of thing. So I think not being scared of the potential success of the thing is also a good idea. Yeah, so my, did people hear the question? No. No, okay. Um, the question was about, you showed us the picture of this kind of peak in, in your life and how do you know, how do you know what is it that you want to achieve and what you want to be the peak? And obviously I will say that anything I say here is just my opinion, so I don't have the perfect answer for any of these things. Um, but my take on this is that the things that make people happiest and most successful are when we align with what I call natural talents, the things that we are just naturally good at. And I had a personal epiphany in my own career early on when I was in, at Yahoo. I worked in marketing and I had risen through the ranks in marketing. I was actually the number two marketing person at Yahoo at the time. It was kind of next in line for the CMO job. And then I realized I didn't want that job. And even though I was pretty good at it, it wasn't the thing that like came really naturally to me and I loved. And what made me realize was that I was at this conference where someone drew up a two by two chart. On the X axis was talents, things that we're naturally good at. And on the Y axis was skills, the things we learn to be good at over time. 
And talents, like the way you can find your talents is ask your family or your childhood friends what you were like as a kid. So like natural born salespeople have been natural born salespeople their whole lives. They were selling lemonade on the corner, et cetera. You know, my husband's an engineer, like he literally was taking apart things from his childhood. You know, I was a, a tutor, like from the tiny age I was, you know, tutoring or teaching or coaching or something like that, that happens to be mine. My kids, like I have one kid who's so focused and determined, like she, even as an infant, she would take everything out of the box and then put everything back in the box. Like very few infants do that or toddlers. Um, and so that is a natural talent. Um, it's not like I'm naturally good at running, although some people have that as a natural talent. It's like, what are the things that, that are core to who you are? And finding those things, the people who are happiest and most successful are in that upper right quadrant. You are doing something you're naturally good at and that you've learned to be good, to do, good at doing. Um, and so that will look different for everybody.